Hello, I'm Sarah Woods, director of the Kentucky Book Festival. Welcome to this 2021 Kentucky Book Festival conversation. We're pleased you've taken time to join us. This program would not be possible without the generous support of the Kentucky Book Festival sponsors and our production partner, Studio 46 Media. The Kentucky Book Festival is a program of Kentucky Humanities, where we've been telling Kentucky's story for nearly 50 years. We're pleased to host two incredible children's authors today, Vashti Harrison and Alice Faye Duncan. Vashti Harrison is an award-winning author, illustrator, and filmmaker. Her most recently illustrated book, Hello Star, is an inspiring story about a love of science and the importance of empathy. Author Alice Faye Duncan is a national board educator whose lyrical picture books help children remember important moments from American history. The authors are joined in conversation by Chioma Brown, a fashion and lifestyle blogger and book lover living in Lexington, Kentucky. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. As, as um, Sarah said, I'm Choma Brown, and I'm just going to kind of jump in and ask um, similar questions to each of you and just kind of get you all to feed off of each other. So I'll start with you, uh, Vashti. Um, can you share how you got started as an illustrator and just how you fell in love with drawing? Oh, man, that's a, that's a big, long question that I'll try to condense and make short. Um, but I want to say thanks so much for bringing us together to have this conversation. I'm really happy to to be at the Kentucky Book Festival. Um, so my my journey into art and illustration is kind of a long one, but it started with me as a little kid loving to draw. I would sit in front of the TV and copy my favorite characters off of from my favorite cartoons. And then as I got older, it involved me flipping through magazines and copying clothes and outfits that I loved. Um, but as I got even older, I discovered new ways of expressing myself. I wasn't just copying anymore. I was telling my own stories. And that's uh, because I discovered filmmaking. I really got inspired by um, being able to put sound and image and motion all together to make stories. And when I went to graduate school to study filmmaking, I went to a school that was really famous for being like the Walt Disney School of Animation. So while I was there, I was like, of course, I'm going to take some drawing classes. I'd be crazy not to. And that's what kind of kickstarted my drawing again. I kind of rekindled this love I had for it. And I was able to approach drawing um, through this new lens of storytelling versus what I was doing as a kid, which was just copying. So um, after, you know, a stint in the film and television industry, I really wanted to be in control of telling my own stories and making them kind of as wild and whimsical and magical as possible without having to worry about film and television budgets. And I just wanted to make the stories uh, visual and on the page and be able to share them with people. And that's what kind of led me into working on books for children. Wow, that's, a, that's such a great story. I love hearing the inspiration and the story behind how someone falls in love with doing something or finds a passion. Um, Alice, I ask you the same thing. What, you know, how did you fall in love with writing and what inspires you to write? Well, I'm an only child, first of all. So I, I grew up in a house with two parents who were teachers. I was the only child. We had a um, home library. And I, in spending a lot of time alone, I found I had a gift for writing. My mother shared with me African-American poets, Gwendolyn Brooks, uh, Langston Hughes. And I found myself uh, like Vashley was saying, copying pictures, I found myself emulating that voice. So a lot of my poems as an eight-year-old, they were in like black vernacular. They were, it was like, you know, Paul Lawrence Dunbar 2.0, but doing Paul Lawrence Dunbar very badly. Um, mm -hmm. And so I've always known that I wanted to be a writer. Met Etheridge Knight in sixth grade. When I saw Etheridge Knight in sixth grade, a poet from the Black Power Movement, uh, when he came to my classroom in sixth grade, I knew then when he showed us his books, he talked about Gwendolyn Brooks. Um, I was like, I can be a writer too. And so here I am. And we share similar backgrounds. Um, I had a love for books at a young age. My dad's a professor. I've taught um, in my past life and even um, previously at UK. So I, I find myself just really engrossed in stories. So how, I'll start with you this time. Um, how do you develop the characters? How do you develop the characters that you choose 
um, for a story? Well, well, you know, mo most of the time, most of my books right now are like uh, historical fiction. So they are steeped in real American history, real yes. history. Right. And um, so what happens is I find a unexplored event like I'm from Memphis. So one of my books was the uh, Memphis, uh, Memphis at the <laughs> Memphis <laughs> strike. You're from Memphis? Yes. Mm -hmm. Get out of here. Oh, my God. OK. Anyway, so you've been to Lorraine, the Lorraine Motel like a it's thousand amazing. times. Right. Yes. But as a teacher, I found out when you ask kids like, uh, where was King killed? They could say Lorraine Motel, but when you ask them why was he killed, they could not tell you why. So anyways, I go for the unexplored history. I try to find somebody living that's connected to the history. And then I spin a, a, a yarn around that. So that's, I'm looking for unexplored histories um, that deserve exploration from children's imagination uh, and emotional space. And, and the, so is that how you came up with the concept for just like mama? Just no, just like a mama happened because I was teaching school 26 years ago and I had a little kid who lived mm -hmm. with her grandmother and she wanted to live with her mom, but she would come to school looking like shiny new money. November is uh, adoption month, by the way, too. Yes. And foster care mm -hmm. month. Uh, but anyways, she would come to school looking like shiny new money. And, uh, and I, but she longed to be with her mom. And so that idea spun from that. But then after writing the story, I then started thinking about my own life. And I was like, wait, I'm living this story because my mother, my grandmother died in 1966. My mother went and adopted her sister. Her sister is my aunt, but she grew up in the house with me. So she's like my sister and my yeah. mother is just like a mama to her. And so that was one of those, it was a fiction, but it came mm -hmm. from my life experience, which is probably why the child resonated so much with me because I was, I was, I had known that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Okay, Vash, I'll, I'll um, um, switch to you. Where did you find your inspiration, even for Hello Star, the Little Leaders, Little Dreamer series? Where do you find your inspiration in, um, some of those stories they've been really pivotal in my even just like my god babies and my nieces i've made sure to give them copies um one of my nephews he was really he was, he was kind of feeling like low self-esteem on the baseball team and so before he tried out i got him that book how about he won he's he was literally their number one player so mm -hmm. in my mind i'm just like you know these books you all just don't realize how they touch children's lives and adults so I just wanted to share that special tidbit. That's, that's really, that's really so sweet. I love hearing stories like that. Um, I think when I'm working um, either on my own books or illustrating other people's books, I'm really trying to keep like really in touch with that kid version of me, the kid who was shy and, you know, like to sit in the corner and just draw quietly and imagine myself in doing amazing things. So I, I think about what that little kid might need or what any kid growing up today might need to see. Or quite honestly, one of the big things for me was I didn't like history when I was little. I didn't like reading it. I thought it was, you know, sad and scary. And, uh, you know, one simple trick I knew that always worked on me was if the book was pretty, I would look at it. If it was like really cute, I would keep looking at it. So, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, I can't discount how the visual affects how you respond to a story. So, um, you know, one thing that I'm constantly doing in my work is trying to make it feel as welcoming and, and, and as uh, inviting as possible for the young reader. Even when we're talking about really intense, dark, deep stories from, from history, from American history, um, you know, that can be intimidating and, and, you know, I think often about the stories that I knew that would have been really helpful for me as a young reader um, that I probably would have discounted because I didn't want to look at the book. Um, so I'm often just trying to imagine what's a fresh, interesting way I can um, create the, the work on the page um, when I'm doing a book like Hello Star, you know, you go to the bookstore, the library, and you can see countless books about astronauts and folks going to outer space but I'm thinking about you know what's a character what does a character look like that I haven't seen in one of these books before or 
how can I make this feel whimsical and magical while still letting it feel really grounded in the science and the technology? So I'm using particular color palettes and particular uh, media and styles to make it feel warm and inviting um, so that there's still some of that wonder and that magic that I knew that like was really attractive to me as a young reader. Oh, I think you described your work perfectly. I look at your books as warm and inviting, both of you, warm and inviting and just wishing I could be a kid again. I really do. <laughs> I really do. And I also um, really like hearing just the, the creation process. So I know we're both, you're an author and an illustrator. Can you share a little bit about the process of um, how do you create the image imagery from a different lens when you aren't the writer, for instance, Solway by Lupita. So I know you did... Um, you illustrated her children's book. How did you sort of immerse yourself into that character to think of what the illustration should look like? Yeah, I mean, that book's always a really good example of uh, challenges that I had to for myself to step outside of who I was as a kid. Um, that was very much her story. And and I I found myself making the sketches a little too sad, a little too quiet, Vashti sitting in the corner. And then I heard back from her, like, oh, no, no, she's not sad here. And I realized, like, oh, yeah, 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 I can't put too much of myself into every one of these characters because it's not correctly conveying what's actually happening in the story. So, I mean, that's a, a pure example of a thing that I had to learn in my creative process to, like, really get into the character and not take too much from myself. But, you know, it's a mixture of, of just doing lots of tests and explorations um, with any book. I always try to figure out who the protagonist is first. Um, I usually assign them a color and kind of build out a palette from there. Um, in Sulway's case, it was about her skin. The narrative is about her skin tone. So the palette for the book is based on, on the color of her skin, whereas um, a book like Hello Star, I, I assign this kind of like cool but also kind of mystically soft pastel mm -hmm. blue um, because so many books about space are like intense and rich and deep colors and it feels so powerful. And I, I, I really wanted it to feel soft and, and uh, kind of turn this idea of what it means to become an astronaut um, on its head and make it a little bit more feminine. Um, uh, so it's, for me, it's about trying to understand, you know, what that character likes or doesn't like and what world they're coming from. And I use color and and tone to get there. Um, and, you know, when I'm working on my own books, the little leaders and little dreamers and little legends, those books are nonfiction. So I had a different kind of um pedagogy for for how I created the artwork but I'm working on my first picture book now that is fiction and and I'm doing some of those same things as you know identifying the protagonist and and making and building the world out from them because uh in in each of those cases the story is told from from their point of view and you know by extension should be like looked at through the kid's point of view and so I want to make it feel like kid reader can get right inside of that story and identify with that character and see everything and and it, we can use color and we can use lighting to help convey how they feel in that moment or you know what they're hoping for so things like that it, it can be really um it can be kind of formulaic sometimes but I think that's kind of cool because a lot of people don't really associate that kind of like math and technology mm -hmm. to to art but really there are really simple ways you can use science um, to help uh, tell a story especially through color absolutely and um and I can absolutely relate to just with my love of color and styling outfits and trying to think of how to tell a story if I wear yellow on a day where it's gray outside you know can I bring some light into the room some joy into the room so I love that you consider that as well and when you're um, creating these beautiful images for your stories and others. Um, and I'm, I can't wait to come back and ask more about your upcoming projects, but I will switch over to Alice and ask about you. Um, of all of the books that you've written, what's been your favorite um, and what has, I guess, taught you the most about yourself? Oh, I think it's on mute. 
Oh, you're on mute, I think. <laughs> my favorite book is is my favorite book is is probably like um, you know, when you're reading, it's it's the one that you're reading at the present mm. time. And so the one I'm writing at the present time yeah. is, my, is my favorite book. It's always the favorite, yes. Yeah, so, so like right now I'm doing this like series on like Negro spirituals and I'm taking Negro spirituals and I'm, I'm making them like stories, right? And so that's really, really been fun. You say, you know, spend something on its head to take a Negro spiritual, which you have deemed as this one way, right? But now you're making it something where sometimes they can be joyful, but most times you think of them as being sad. But now I'm reinterpreting them with joy. So that's fun. And then also my favorite books are always the newest ones about to, you know, be released. And so I have Opal Lee and What It Means to Be Free, which is the story of the grandmother of Juneteenth, which I'm very excited about because it has a red Kool-Aid recipe in it. (laughs) And so Juneteenth is... (laughs) Juneteenth, you drink, you know, you drink, yes. you drink red Kool-Aid, you have red foods, you know, barbecue, spaghetti, et cetera, and so on. So I'm really excited about that. And that'll be uh, released January 11th. And then I have a new book. Uh, Vashti was talking about um, taking things that are normally very uh, stark, but then making them soft and accessible. So I've got a yes. new book called Evicted which is about the voting rights struggle in America, but it's, it's talking about the voting rights struggle that began in 1959 in Fayette County, Tennessee. Nobody knows about it. Ain't nobody never heard of it, but it was inspired because of a lynching. And so when you think of lynching, of course you think of things frightening, right? Yes. Um, but the, the, the illustrator, Charlie Palmer, he's taking it and, and done something really nice. So. It's traumatic, yes. You cannot mm-hmm. deny that it is traumatic. Right, right, right. But it's accessible in the context of a child's life and what children were doing at that time. And so that's my favorite. I mean, it's it's the one that I'm love the one you're with. So it's the one that I'm with <laughs> right now. <laughs> so so um and, and so yeah, so that's my favorite one. Well, I'll um ask you this question. Um how is how is the collaborative process when you're working with illustrators in communicating, you know, how you want your characters to be displayed or how does well, what is that process like? Well, most times, you know, as Vashti can can tell you, most times there's really not a, a real collaboration at the beginning. Uh, a illustrator evaluates your manuscript to see if it's something that they would be potentially interested in doing. And then you let the illustrator do the illustrations because painters paint. And writers right. write. And so sometimes the illustrator might want your suggestion. For example, uh, the Tent City book was about a Fayette County, Tennessee. The illustrator, Charlie, he, he'd never been to Fayette County, didn't know about it. So he was like, hey, do you have uh, a reserve of pictures that I can go to? And I was able to direct him to the University of Memphis, which is where mm-hmm. they have like a whole study on the movement. Um, but, but, you know, but sometimes you really find a connection with an illustrator and you just know that this is, this is something symbiotic and some kind of synergy is going on right here. And so like, um, and, and so I, I've got some favorite illustrators that I, that I like working with. Cause it's just like, it's just like, it's just understanding like, our it's it's just, like, yeah. it's just good. Um, and, and one of it's Gregory Christie. I love working with Gregory Christie. Um, I guess, I don't know, it's because he's a music thing. He used to do music albums or something. I don't know. I just yeah. love, I love, <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I, yeah, I just, I love hearing about the, just the behind the scenes process. Um, I'll ask the same question to Vashti about the, your favorite book that you're reading or writing right now and, you know, what it's taught, just taught you about yourself. Um, well, I... I'm really happy with this book that just came yeah. out. You know, it's always a weird process. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, uh, I'm sure we're all our own hard, harshest critics, um, but I was really happy um, with the final product of this book because I had more time uh, to work on this one. So over the past couple of years, I've only been working in on, in and on books um, for about five years and uh, in that time I said yes to everything and so 
uh, what that meant was like, I did like eight books in, in like two years time. And what they, I did in the same year, I did Sulway, Hair, Love, CC, Love, Science and Adventure. And I wrote and illustrated leader, wow. uh, little dreamers, visionary women around the world. It was just wow. way too much work. Wow. Uh, so I actually got the time to slow down um, and really uh, think about the style and the illustrations in this book a little bit differently. And it is the first one that I've done. That's a mixture of traditional media and digital media. Um, whereas everything else I've done has been completely digital. So done on the computer. Um, and, and, you know, I'm always hesitant to use the word traditional versus digital because, you know, I, I don't think that there should be a hierarchy or a morality level to what type of media we're using to tell stories. It's just like each of these are a tool and and I don't value one or the other. But I I do think that as like a, a like a full on mixed media artist, I want to be able to tell a story in the best medium possible. So be that film or or pastel or, you know words or colored pencils so this one was really special in that I got to do a ton of tests maybe it was a little too much time because if you saw all the tests that I did you would be like well a little like your head would be spinning because my mind was for a little (laughs) while but uh you know I got to spend time like really getting into the work and making sure um each piece was thought about and so um I did a bunch of tests in in like gouache and watercolor I was testing out this kind of metallic watercolor that looked like stars when I photographed it so at one point I thought I was going to paint all of the textures on glass or on black background uh, and photograph it to make it look like deep space I was like in it Um, but in the end I found a way that could make it feel really soft and dreamy and kind of like a nighttime good like a bedtime book while still feeling like a book filled with like facts about science and technology uh, with colored pencil and, and digital coloring on top. So um, as like, as an artist, I really appreciate the opportunity to take that time to, to, and the freedom to do it in the way that I felt uh, best accurately or best appropriately uh, married the story, the images with the story. Oh, that makes so much sense. And I'm I'm glad. I know time is a luxury. So I'm really glad that you have that kind of time to pour into this project. Um, I will switch to Alice. Or if Alice, you want to chime in, go on. Um, <laughs> well, just- I-, I wanted to say something really interesting. Yeah, of um, like Vashti said, she she had that year of like writing or, or creating yeah. eight books. Well, she had the luxury and, and that is wonderful because I assume that Vashti, were you working full time or were you working and creating? Were you working uh, on a job? Working on books is my full time job now. Oh no, I think Alice broke. Okay, did something happen? Yeah, might have frozen up. I froze. Oh, you're back. <laughs> okay, say that again. Uh, well, I I work on and I illustrate and write books full time. That's my full time job. Okay. And so and so and so I don't. I I've I've not I I don't have the luxury uh I don't have the economic luxury of creating full time. And so that's what I think a lot of kids don't understand. Sometimes they think writers and illustrators are exclusively writing or exclusively illustrating yeah, and there are there are a few who do have that luxury. But the majority of those creating books for kids and creating books for adults um, yeah. don't have the luxury. And so it is a good fortune um, that Vashti has that time because now she can cre- you know, create all these wonderful and necessary uh, books for kids. So that's, it's a wonderful thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And both of you all inspire me so much with just even the amount of time and thought and attention to detail in this, in your storytelling and in how you want to, you know, portray your images to, to children. So um, I guess my next question would be, what is a piece of, I'll start with Alice, what's a, a piece of advice you would give to your younger self, you know, um, as an as- aspiring writer or if you... 
I, I, I would, that revision is the best writing. That revision is absolutely necessary. Um, I sold my first book to Macmillan, I think when I was 24 and I'm now like, you know, double that. Right. Um, and I, I did, I think I did like two books. I was 24 and I thought, oh, I've got it. I've got the magic touch. Right. And so with me doing that, I was not committed to revision. I was like, okay, you have a thought, you have an idea, you put pen to paper and you start writing and you go to your agent here, here, here. And my agent was like, no, 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 you need revision. You need to go back. And, and I was, but I was 24 and I was young and I was just not wise. And, um, and so it's now taken me, you know, two decades to realize for children too, that when your teacher is telling you to revise, when your teacher is telling you you need a second draft, a third draft, a fourth draft, I always say, you know, revision makes, you know, makes poetry ring. You've got to go back and go back and go back. Vasti was talking about those tests and the test and the test and the test, but all of those tests is bringing you to the best book for the reader. Absolutely. Yeah, that that sounds so close to one of my favorite quotes that I read right at the time where I was kind of rekindling my love for drawing from this guy, Walt Stanchfield, who was a, an educator at the Walt Disney Studios. He was an animator and an educator. And he said that uh, we all have 10,000 bad drawings inside of us. Uh, the sooner we get them out, the better. And I, I appreciate that because it implies like, that, those bad things they're not a party you just got to get them out but you have to do it you have to do the work and each bad drawing is one step in the journey towards being the artist that you want to be and you can't skip over it it's going to be there um but I think like uh by the time I heard that I was really I was ready I I, I got it right away because what happened when I picked up drawing again was that I was not good I stopped drawing from the time I was like 18 until the time I was like 24. So it doesn't feel like that's a long time, but six years without doing something um, mm -hmm. is going to have an impact. I always tell kids, it's kind of like running. If you're a really fast runner and you stopped running for six years, are you going to be able to pick up right where you left off? No. And they're always like, no. And it's true about drawing. Some people think that like it's a talent that some people have and some people don't. And that is not true. It is a skill that anyone can learn. You just have to be able, you have to just do the, do the work, do your 10,000 drawings, your 10,000 hours, whatever it may be. Um, and uh, I could see like my hand was not doing the things I was trying to tell it to do. I was like, well, what happened to me? I used to be so good at this. Uh, and I realized like if I just keep working at this, I will get better. And so I made it a goal of mine from that time to draw every single day. Um, but the, the big piece of advice that I could have really used long before that um, was something that it, it felt like it took forever to learn. But I, I glossed right over this part. But I, when I was young, I thought I was a bad writer and I was scared to share my writing with anybody. I was so scared to take AP English the summer before senior year, I was crying. In the middle of the summer, I was crying and so scared that someone, that I was gonna take this college course and I was gonna be bad at it. Fast forward um, to college, I was, because everyone has to take their English writing requirement, there are all these different courses you can take. You can take a, a writing class on fairy tales, on rock and roll, on this, on that. And I ended up in one about film and it kind of opened up something in me. I realized when I had something to say, I became less afraid. Mm -hmm. I had to learn how to write and I did. And over the course of that class, I had to write like five, five page papers, but they got easier as they went because I had more and more that I knew that I wanted to say because I was excited about studying filmmaking. I was excited about telling stories. Um, so you know, that stuff, it's not easy. It's not easy to shake off the fear. I have it all the time, the like the anxiety or the imposter syndrome. But for me, it was about realizing that the work is more important than my fear right now. And the joy that I get from doing this thing, regardless of, you know, whether I do it for my job, but 
mostly because I'm doing it for myself and because I love it, um, outweighs that fear. And once I began sharing that work with people, I was able to get notes on big and ways to improve. And I got less and less afraid throughout that process. So I hope uh, any young writer, new writer, any writer, anyone who hears this advice, even, even if it's not the young version of me, <laughs> appreciates like, bro, it is hard, but uh, it's not as uh, hard as not doing the thing that you love. You know, you know, I, I heard this preacher one time, he was talking about uh, growing up in Mississippi and he said he used to have this old woman that was his neighbor and he would go to her and say, oh, you know, school is rough, this and that. And the old lady would say, it are hard, but it can be did. So <laughs> it are hard, but it can be did. Yes. <laughs> well, that's so good, especially because I think... Um, it almost feels like, I think Vashti mentioned that you were shy when you were growing up. Did you mention you were a little bit shy? Now, Alice, were you like that? Was writing a tool that you used to get your voice out? Or were you all, you know, what was you, what were you like as a child? Oh, writing, writing was like something that, that chose me. I was a talker, as you can see. I, I, was, I was talking. It's like, if, and if didn't nobody in, in the in the seats next to me have nothing to talk about, I would go and hold a conversation with the teacher. So I, I was I was I was a talker. Um, but writing to me, just like when I had my encounter with my, my first poetry books, all of those voices, the, the Gwendolyn Brooks, the Maya Angelos, the Langston Hughes, the Paul Lawrence number. I, I think also too, what it was is my mother was very, my mother, my mother can tell you like all kind of poems that she remembered from her childhood. Cause I guess in segregated schools they made the kids remember a lot of poetry but my mother could like just rattle out poetry and so she would get me up in the morning with uh paula's number right last last bless the lord don't you know the day is brought if you don't get up you scamp there'll be trouble in this camp so i mean so my mom i was the only child when you're only child grown people are talking and you don't have the good sense to think that you are not in the conversation so you're free to participate mm -hmm. so 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 Really, writing was an extension of my, is verbosity a word? Writing was an extension of me just being very uh, yeah. verbal. Yeah. Oh, that's good. I think um, just that for children to be able to hear, you know, that authors from different backgrounds. That can have like, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Different paths. And still there's this feeling of, of not only inclusion, but being seen when we read your book. You know, but, I, mm -hmm. but but isn't it regional too? Because Vashti, where are you from? What city are you from? I'm from the eastern shore of Virginia. Okay, and so and I and I'm from Memphis, which is the front door of the Mississippi Delta. And so you know, so you've got you got regional things going on too. Um, and in terms of like exposure, like Vashti was probably ex I don't know exposed to artists and things from that, but I was exposed to Southern people like Etheridge Knight, you know, and the voice that that I adhered to or was drawn to was a, uh, uh, Paul Lynch number is not from the South, but he, he spoke into something that I heard, you know. Right. So who were the artists, Vashti, that influenced you? Yes, that's a perfect pickup question. I think we have room for one more. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I... I think that most of my inspiration from when I was really young mostly came from the media that I had access to. So books like um, I like I distinctly remember um, having a Jerry Pinkney book. Um, really sad to hear about his passing, but such a special illustrator. And I remember pouring through the illustrations of his books. I remember we didn't, my mom didn't buy me a lot of books. It was not a thing that we spent money on books, but we went to the library and I had access to books in school. Um, and I remember copying a lot of illustrations from, from like, I remember the rainbow fish and, and corduroy. Um, but quite honestly, it was the nineties. So TV was King. And so I was getting as, much um cartoons as possible <laughs> um 
and and think that my older sister was into, which was fashion. So, you know, it was very pop culture inspired. But I had an uncle who was a photographer and started this um, Black Heritage tour company in Baltimore. And he found out that I was into art and he bought me all kinds of um kind of monographs and and intro to art history books. And so that's when I got my first introduction to a lot of the masters. Um, but I think my 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 tastes now are really come from realizing that uh, my mom's stories about growing up in Trinidad were really influential on the ideas that I had and that growing up in Virginia and wanting to go on adventures in the woods made such a huge impact on, on the way I feel about portraying nature and, and growing up in a really small town without a lot of kids, my age made me feel really passionate about making stories with lots of kids getting together, doing something. So it was a lot of like filling in the gaps of what I didn't have or what I wanted. And that's what was always so special about art making is that it could fill in those gaps for me. And Alice, you meant, do you have any other inspirations? It's been awesome hearing Vashti's inspiration. Um, any other um, inspired you? Uh, let's see, who was here? Uh, Gwendolyn Brooks was an inspiration, which is why, you know, she was the mother of Etheridge Knight in terms of his literary mother. And, and so I just, you know, her stuff, was, you'd have to grapple with it because she would go from being easily understood um, to being very difficult to understand. And so with that, I know we're at the end, but I also, I try to take what is very difficult and make it easy to understand, not simplistic, but accessible. And so if, if I can, I just want to share, because I know that there will be children who will, I want to share this poem that I wrote for Dr. King uh, in my Memphis Martin and Mountaintop book. And it's just a very short poem, but I hope that it will inspire kids to keep on keeping on, to keep on going. Like Vashi said, do the test, do the test, revise, mm -hmm. revise, revise. And the name of the poem is Mountaintop. And it goes like this, Mountaintop. Dream big, walk tall, be strong, march on, don't quit, never stop, climb up the mountaintop. Oh, I love it. I love it and I feel like I needed to hear that. <laughs> so, um, we, all we, all did. we all need to hear that and I just can't thank you all enough for one, just taking the time to talk with me and being invited to interview you. You are both such inspirations as a, a young child who read tons of books and wrote book reports for her daddy and started a book club in eighth grade. <laughs> I like the, the, the young girl inside of me was just so excited and I know it's virtual and I wish I could give you all a hug and just, you know, all the, just all well, the good stuff. Well, it's, you've been it's wonderful. Perfect. You've been a wonderful host, Professor Brown. You've been a wonderful host. And <laughs> thank Vashti, you so thank you for allowing me to be on this panel with you. Thank you, Sarah, for the invitation. It's been a blessing, thank indeed. It's a pleasing pleasure. Yes, our phenomenal women. I just have, I'm so excited I get to tell you that and thank give you your flowers. And thank you, yes, Sarah and Studio 46 um, for having me host these two um, just incredible, phenomenal women. Thanks to Vashti Harrison, Alice Faye Duncan, and Shoma Brown for such an interesting discussion. Of course, we want to thank you for joining us for this 2021 Kentucky Book Festival program. If you're interested in purchasing one of the books discussed today, please visit our independent bookstore partner, Joseph Beth Booksellers, at josephbeth.com. Remember to follow us on social media at KY Humanities and visit kybookfestival.org for news and updates. For the Kentucky Book Festival, I'm Sarah Woods.